The season of Advent has many themes tied to each of the Sundays. The theme of hope began Advent for us with the expectation of Christ's return. And the theme of peace shapes our readings, our thoughts and reflections today. So let us pray. Gracious God, draw near to us once more with your gospel of good news, your word of hope and peace for all. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer, O Prince of Peace. Amen. So as a companion to the gospel lesson that was from, Mark, uh, from Luke's Gospel about John the Baptist. We have two short passages from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Scripture. And the first, they're printed in the bulletin for you as well, but the first comes from one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk. Habakkuk is writing during a time when the land is being threatened, and he has lifted up a lament to God in the first chapter. And then in the second chapter, he awaits an answer and receives one. This is Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. The prophet says, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and what God will answer concerning my complaint. And then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it does not lie. And if it seems to tarry, then wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And paired with that, a verse from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. Echoing John the Baptist, it says, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. May God bless the reading and the hearing of God's word. Now the story goes that when the Declaration of Independence was finally composed in 1776, the president of the Continental Congress, John Hancock of Massachusetts, signed the document first with a great and large flourish. And then supposedly Hancock said there, now his majesty can read my name without spectacles and he can double the reward on my head. That signature of Hancock has gone down in history as an example of an unafraid public witness, a testimony where you put what you believe front and center for all to see. It calls to mind the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 when Christ said, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, Hancock's signature on the Declaration of Independence was a bold act and one that was visible and disruptive to many. Martin Luther, when he nailed his 95 theses on the cathedral door in Wittenberg, also did a similar public and disruptive act. Or the Civil Rights March, when the time of Hosea Williams and John Lewis and a group of people marched from Montgomery to Selma and crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965. That march became a bloody confrontation with state troopers. And it too was a public disruptive act written large so that all may see. The point is, if things are going to change, whatever is truly important to you as a person of faith, must be publicly acknowledged, even proclaimed in a way that everyone can see it. Now we know almost nothing about the prophet Habakkuk. He lived around the same time as the prophet Jeremiah in the kingdom of Judah region when it was being attacked and threatened by the Chaldeans or the Babylonian powers. 
The first words recorded in the little book of Habakkuk are a lament. And he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Habakkuk's words, though, are not just an accusation or a grievance. They are a lament, which means they are words spoken from the heart to a God who hears. Every lament, every lament, even the most angry and virulent one, presupposes that they will be answered, they will be heard by God. And Habakkuk himself expected an answer from God. That's why he says in chapter 2, look, I go to the top of the city watchtower. I station myself on the ramparts, the very top of the wall, keeping watch and waiting for the Lord's answer. And an answer did come. It's an answer that's spread out in the book talking about patience and steadfast love and about peace. But what I want to focus on was that instruction given to Habakkuk when he was told, write that answer big. Make it plain, make it visible, so that even a passing runner may see it and understand. Write it big so that all may see. Now, in addition to the prophet Habakkuk, we heard today also from John the Baptist, crying out publicly in the wilderness about a time when the valleys will be lifted up and the mountains brought low and the crooked made straight so that all may see the salvation of God. And we also heard the one verse from the prophet Isaiah about a time again when mountains and hills will pass away, but God's steadfast love, God's covenant of peace will never end. All of these are big words. They're big answers. They're things worthy of being writ large so that all can see them. But writing what we believe in large letters always comes at a cost. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were officially guilty of crimes against the crown of England. They were guilty of sedition and treason. And as such, it meant that their property and they and their families would be specifically targeted by the British forces in the Revolutionary War. The marchers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma paid a heavy toll for their public witness on that day in 1965, witnessing for civil rights, with some of them not only being beaten but even losing their lives on that bloody Sunday. To speak up for justice, to speak up for change, to write large what we believe is God's will for this world is not easy. Take, for example, the theme for today's service, the Advent theme of peace. Now, peace is everywhere this time of year. It's on store banners. It's on those cards that we send to one another that proclaim peace on earth, goodwill to all. But peace is far more than just the absence of war. True peace comes when war stops being an option. Peace requires us to be vulnerable, not belligerent or vengeful. Because it means what we're doing is taking on others' pain and suffering, and then we choose to move beside them together to stop whatever has caused the grief. It means we choose to change how we do things, especially if how we do them is unjust, militaristic, unpeaceful. Now that means at times as people of faith, we will proclaim things that by God's grace we understand to be wise, but the world will see as foolish and totally impractical. We will declare things that will have to be written large enough for a person far away to read it clearly, even a runner on the road or King George without his spectacles. We will have to do it publicly, disruptively, even revolutionary. 
Ruth Wilson Gilmore is an African-American professor of earth sciences. But Ruth Gilmore also happens to be a strong advocate for the abolition of prisons. Several years ago, she was at a conference about environmental justice, and some student participants on the conference heard that she was going to be there, and they got word to her that they wanted to actually talk to her alone. Now, the youth were primarily Latino, many of them sons and daughters of farm workers in the valleys of California. And most of the youth were middle schoolers, which means they're old enough to have strong opinions and typically to distrust all adults. And when they met with her, they couldn't believe that she wanted to close prisons. And so they asked her, what about the people who have done something seriously wrong? What about people who hurt or kill other people? Gilmore knew that these kids had already seen the harshness of the world and they weren't going to be easily persuaded. So she said, look, I get where you're coming from, but how about this? Instead of talking about who should be locked up and who should go free, why don't we ask instead about trying to solve problems without repeating the behavior that caused the problem in the first place? She asked them to consider why we as a society choose to believe that cruelty and vengeance are the right answers. She told the group that in Spain, the average time served in prison for murdering someone was seven years. And the kids responded in disbelief that there could be such short sentences. But Gilmore went on. She said, well, in Spain, they decided that life has enough value that they're not going to behave in a punitive and life-annihilating way toward anyone, even those who hurt others. The criminal justice approach conveyed a message that says, where life is precious, then all life is precious. Now, the kids were a tough sell. They told her, well, they'd think about it. But Gilmore felt defeated. At the end of the day, the kids then made a presentation to the entire conference. And they announced that in their workshop, they had decided that there were three environmental hazards that most affected their lives. And they said those hazards are pesticides, police, and prisons. And Gilmore was amazed, yet hardened, that they'd seen this link between human reality and the ways that we treat the environment and one another. They'd taken to heart what she said. Where an individual life is valued, treated justly, respectfully, in a word seen as precious, then all life has the chance to be peace-filled and sustainable, and in a word, precious. Now, there's a lot more that can be said on this one particular topic. It is simply not clear that prisons truly deter crime or increase public safety. How prisons are not an inevitable choice, but they simply reflect the option we have chosen and an expensive bill we regularly pay. 10.3 million people a year, many accused of nonviolent offenses, are circulating through our local jail systems in this country. And how most people age out of being any sort of a significant risk for crime by the time they reach the age of 30, but because of long and punitive sentences, we actually are increasing the risk they will reoffend because we've shattered all of their family ties, their work possibilities, and their housing. Now, this isn't a, a controversy that can be solved by a discussion with statistics but it's one perhaps where Christians could offer a different truth to a hurting world, a gospel truth, a word of peace that's writ large so that all may see it. If we believe life is precious 
and act on it, then all life is precious. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, once said that the deepest enemy to peace is always the spirit of grasping and clinging to what makes us feel safe. While the truth is that we will only be safe when others are not frightened of us, when others do not feel silenced, despised, or suffocated by us. Habakkuk stood on this city wall high on the ramparts, knowing that the city was going to be besieged and troubled. And so his lament was offered to God and was heard. And God said, write it in an answer that all could see. And God still says the same instruction to each of us, to speak up in ways that are clear and unequivocal to challenge the dominant views whenever such views diminish or demean God's children, to know that life is too precious for us to be crueler in our punishments than the crimes we seek to prevent. And life is too short to settle for anything other than a true covenant of peace with God and with one another. And to write that covenant big, boldly, disruptively, so that all can see it. This Advent season, ask yourself, what, what do I believe in? And what do I believe in enough to write it big enough that all the world could see it? Now finally, just before this sermon, we sang the old carol, it came upon a midnight clear. Now, the text was written by a Massachusetts clergyman named Edmund Sears, and he wrote the carol in 1847. That period was a turbulent time in American history of the Industrial Revolution, of the country carving out its new identity, but also being torn apart by the rancor of the pre-Civil War years. And the last verse we sang is still our challenge for today. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophets seen of old, when with the ever-circling years shall come the time foretold when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world send back the song which now the angels sing. It's the answer we've been waiting for. And it's something worth writing big so that everyone can see it, no matter the cost, that they may know the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.